just waiting for our, the new slides to come on. Great. I'm going to be talking about behavioral, or what are sometimes called lifestyle interventions, that are the cornerstone for both prevention and treatment of obesity. They're very important when you work with children or adults. And they really are critical for the sex success of the pharmacotherapy and bariatric surgery that we're going to be discussing next. So what do we mean by a lifestyle or a behavioral program? It's actually a comprehensive group of different strategies that I just want to show you here. First of all, all of these programs set a weight goal for the participants, typically the goal of losing one to two pounds a week with the hope that you would achieve a five to 10% weight loss by the end of six months and then maintain it. To achieve that weight loss goal, individuals in the program are given a reduced calorie goal, typically 1,000 calories below what they've been eating before. Now, the important thing to realize about this is that caloric restriction, this is the message that Dr. Khan was making this morning, it's caloric restriction that's related to weight loss. You can lose weight with a low calorie, excuse me, a low fat diet or a low carbohydrate diet. There may be different cardiovascular outcomes from them, but the weight loss will be the same if you reduce your calories the same. So for weight loss, the key ingredient is caloric restriction and adherence. So if you're trying to pick a diet for an individual patient, what you want to do is select a diet that they'll adhere to and it will restrict their calories. Now the third component of a lifestyle program is increasing physical activity. The activity that we focus on is typically walking, brisk walking, and we encourage people to gradually increase the amount of exercise they're doing until they're doing 50 minutes, um, 50 minutes on each of five days in the week. So we get there slowly, starting out trying to just get to 30 minutes, so 150 minutes per week, and then gradually move to 200 and 250 minutes per week of physical activity. Now, the important thing to realize, somebody said this morning, physical activity wasn't so important for weight loss. It's not, but it's very important for weight loss maintenance. So it's a very key part of our intervention programs. Now, to get people, to help people change their eating and exercise behaviors, we use a group of different behavioral strategies, most important of which is self-monitoring. So we encourage people to weigh themselves frequently and to write down all the foods that they're eating and their physical activity. And then they can begin to see patterns between their behavior changes and their weight. And they can learn from these patterns and make behavior changes. And we also encourage people to change their own home environment. You may not be able to take down all the McDonald's signs around your neighborhood, but at least you can keep from buying the high calorie foods and bringing them into your home. And then we also encourage people to use problem solving techniques to work on individual issues that are difficult for them. For example, if they're having trouble with eating out in restaurants or problems with emotional eating. And we deal with that and that helps individualize the program. And finally, another key component in a behavioral program is frequent contact. It's recommended that people in behavioral programs are, are seen weekly for the first 14, 14 weeks and then monthly thereafter. It's really a chronic disease model <coughs> in which we believe that people need ongoing care. And these, this ongoing care provides support and emphasizes accountability on the part of the participant. So what kind of results do we achieve with this type of lifestyle program? Well, I want to show you two of the largest trials that have been done in this area. One is the Diabetes Prevention Program, which is a study with 3,000 individuals who had impaired glucose tolerance. And the other is Look Ahead, a study with 5,000 individuals who had type 2 diabetes. And what I want to show you on this slide is the similarity in the two interventions. Both of these groups, first of all, in both of these studies, you can see the control group at the top loses little or no weight. The lifestyle interventions in both of these programs is, are very similar, and they use all the components I just described to you. And you can see that the maximal weight loss is achieved at about six months or one year, and it's typically eight to 10 kilograms or percent body weight. And then after losing that weight, there is a gradual regain in weight, so that by four years, participants have maintained a weight loss of about four to five kilograms or four to five percent. So what's striking to me is the similarity in both of these slides. <coughs> the message, I think, is that these are modest weight losses, and unfortunately, they're not perfectly maintained over time. The best results are initially, with some regain. 
But what I want to emphasize to you is that these modest weight losses have dramatic health impact. In the diabetes prevention program, they reduce the risk of developing diabetes by 58% relative to the control. Now, over time, when we followed people in the diabetes study, they regained weight, and actually, after a while, at 10 years, there was no difference in weight loss between the control group and the intervention group. But the difference in the development of diabetes persisted. So it suggests that there's a legacy effect, that if you lose weight, even if you regain it, there's a positive long-term impact of that period of weight loss. Now, Look Ahead also showed that modest weight loss has had dramatic health impact. We did not show that modest weight loss reduced cardiovascular morbidity and mortality, which was our primary outcome. But it did reduce sleep apnea, kidney disease, incontinence, um, depression, hospitalizations, and medical care costs. So a little bit of weight loss has a big health impact. Now clearly, one of the issues on this slide is the problem with long-term maintenance. And I think this is an important problem for all of us in this field. One of the things nobody has spoken about yet is the increasing evidence that when an individual loses weight, even if they lose weight intentionally, the body starts to fight against that weight loss. And there are many mechanisms that take place that produce or increase the risk of regain. So that after you lose weight, you're hungrier than before. You, the palatability of food increases. Your satiety decreases. You're more metabolically efficient. The same walk that you took before has less metabolic benefit for you. So all of these lead to predispose you to regain. And the same thing's true with behavioral approaches. After a while, you get sick of the diet, bored with it. So again, that's going to lead to poorer adherence and gradual weight regain. So one of the areas that I think we need to work on as a field is how do we compensate for these changes that occur with weight loss and predispose to regain? How do we help people maintain their weight loss? So that's the bad news. The good news is that there are some people and many people who are able to do this. So I'm often told that nobody ever succeeds at weight loss, and I really resent that. Because in Look Ahead, we can show that at least over <coughs> one third of the people who started the program were successful. They met the 5% weight loss goal at both one year, four years, and eight years. So they have lost weight and maintained it over a third of the patients in that trial. We also have a registry of successful weight losers called the National Weight Control Registry where we have 10,000 people who lost, on average, 70 pounds and kept it off six years. And we find that what characterizes both of these groups of patients is that they are willing to adhere to the behavior changes long term. So the question for us becomes, how do, why are these people able to adhere long term, and how do we help others to do that? Now, I'd like to just briefly turn to two other topics very quickly. One is that we need to work as a field to reduce variability in our treatment outcomes. If you do a lifestyle intervention, some people will be very successful, and others will do very poorly. Baseline characteristics, including genetics, do not predict how people will do. But adherence does, even initial adherence. So what I've shown on this slide here are look-ahead participants divided by their weight loss at four weeks. And you can see that there's a group of people who do very well at four weeks. And they continue to track for the next 12 months, continuing to do well. And by the way, I can extend this out to nine years, and they continue to do well. And then there's another group who do very poorly at four weeks, and they continue to do poorly over time. We know that we can help the people who are doing poorly initially by trying to work more intensively with them. And we need to figure out how best to adjust to these different personal, different individual differences. And finally, I know I'm over time, but I'm just going to make one other point. Everybody always assumes, presumes, that behavioral lifestyle interventions are so expensive. That's really not true. We have now shown several ways that we can deliver these inexpensively. The DPP YMCA program is an example of that. We're doing it through phone call therapy. And this is a slide that I'm showing you here of an online weight loss program that my colleague Graham Thomas and I have been using. Patients are referred to this program by their physician. Once they enter the program, everything is automated. The patient receives the lessons, they self-monitor, they get feedback. Everything is totally done for free, automated. And we're producing weight losses with this program that are almost equivalent to what you were getting with DPP and Look Ahead. 
So in conclusion, I think lifestyle interventions are going to form the basis of all our efforts to prevent and treat obesity. We produce modest weight losses, but those weight losses have big health benefits. And lifestyle interventions can indeed be done cost effectively. Thanks.